All right. Uh, thanks, John. And thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to be discussed. And I want to thank the authors for providing me with three very interesting papers. Uh, just want to say all the normal disclaimers apply. These are my views and my views alone. So first, I want to do a quick summary of the papers. So all three are focused on uh, how economic shocks affect retirement outcomes. The first two are focused on how uh, the how in, uh, the impact of COVID was on the probability workers enter retirement, albeit they define retirement differently. differently. Uh, Courtney and Hayes' analysis is narrowly focused on the period just before and after COVID arriving and uses a familiar data set in a very unfamiliar way. Uh, Erica's paper is a bit has a bit broader focus examining a period that actually spans three recessions um, and looks at both flows into and out of retirement and using a very unique <coughs> administrative data set to construct quarterly earnings histories. Uh, the third uh, paper looks at a somewhat different shock, and that is the shock of being born a millennial, a cohort that has experienced a lemony snicket-like series of unfortunate events. And uh, Rich and Karen compare millennials to previous birth cohorts they use available data to document their experience to date, and they use the Dynason model to uh, project how they'll do in retirement. I will say there are many things I like about all three papers, and I do have suggestions for all three authors, but rather than trying to forensically uh, examine each paper in the very short time I have with you today, uh, what I'm going to try to do is uh, step back, take a very broad view of some very big picture issues, and then try to relate those, those issues to the papers. <clears throat> all right. So before thinking about how people should respond to shocks, I want to first go over um, how we expect people to behave when nothing happens, when everything, in the cart as they would say in a cartoon, is going exactly to plan. So uh, I'm going to do this with an example that's uh, loosely based on the life cycle model. So let's go through the example. And let's uh, uh, say this, this example represents my lifetime. Uh, at age 22, the gods come and visit me, and they reveal, reveal to me my entire future. I know exactly how much I'll make in every period, when I'll stop working, and uh, although I don't know uh, the exact date of my death, I know the probability that I'll die in every period. So the question is, being a very rational person, uh, how, would I, uh, how, how would I consume and how would I save? And uh, the answer is that what I would do is that early on, I'd actually consume more than my income and take on some debt. Uh, I'd pay off that debt, and sometime around uh, after age 40, I'd actually start saving for retirement. <clears throat> At retirement, um, I would then uh, take everything I own uh, by an annuity and, and have a, a lifetime income stream after that. That's around whenever I'm alive. So um, now there are many, uh, beyond the gods visiting me, there are many obviously very simplistic assumptions in here uh, that, that don't seem very realistic. I'm going to go through a couple that, uh, that affect the results, which I think are in ways that I think are relevant uh, for our discussion today. So uh, one is uh, assumptions that there's no government and, and particularly there's no social security system. So why is that important? Well, in this model, I can, uh, all that matters is the pattern of my earnings for how I save. If I double income, uh, my consumption doubles. If I uh, cut it in half, my consumption goes down by half. Uh, what Social Security uh, does is that actually if, if my income is going down, I'm, I don't have to save as much, uh, even if, so I have the same pattern, but it's lower. And that's because Social Security is going to replace a higher share of my income. Uh, the other thing is uh, all, all this consumption is done by, uh, there's a one co composite consumption good that I have to purchase these, each period. So why is that important? Well, um, uh, so what people want to do in retirement is not replace income or, or even uh, spending. They want to replace consumption. Now, here, consumption and spending are the same thing, but some goods like housing and other long-lived goods um, uh, are, uh, uh, will provide consumption services uh, unrelated to when we did the actual spending. And then, of course, a big one is uh, there's no children, and so um, unless I'm doing something wrong, a uh, uh, they take up a lot of my resources and I may not have to replace that. Okay, so now let's relate this big picture to the paper. So one is the, the concept of replacement rate. As Rich told you, he uses a 75% replacement rate. Again, uh, that's a very rough um, um, uh, measure. Um, people don't want to replace income and they don't, again, don't even want to replace spending. Um, so uh, where the 75% re uh, replacement comes from, as far as I can tell, is the early 1980s report of a presidential commission. And they used very simplistic reasoning. They said, 
uh, why you need you don't need a, a dollar of income to replace uh, uh, in retirement to replace a dollar wages because first off uh, you don't have to replace the, um, the Social Security uh, or um, the payroll taxes that's you know say seven and a half percent your tax income taxes go down in retirement let's say it's ten percent and uh, you're saving uh, and let's base it on what in the early eighties the savings rate people thought it was uh, nationally about seven percent that's how you get to eighty five so. Um, uh, it's a very crude measure, and I actually think the dinosaur model might be able to come up with a, a better model. All right, the second thing is how do you define retirement? All right, so in this model, you know, in this example, it's very simple. It's when I stop working. It turns out uh, when you look at how people behave, this doesn't really correspond to the way people behave. Uh, it's more of a, to me, a, a very long process than a, an actual point in time. And uh, so uh, in, in my mo most recent research, I, I'm using an approach much like Rich where I'm uh, basically taking their, you know, their income when most people are working and then comparing it to the income when most people are retired. Um, and I'm not trying to define a point in time. Um, the, the authors of several papers are trying to define a point in time. Um, and, and so that will have some impact. Okay, <clears throat> so now that's how people, if they know everything, that's how they'll respond. What happens when there's a shock? So uh, stick with me in my example, the gods come down, they tell me what's going on and I'm blithely going around at age 45. Uh, uh, I realize the gods are capricious and they say, uh, I lied to you uh, from now on, everything's going to be 20, your earnings are going to be 20% uh, less than I told you. And so then the question is, how should, how would a rational person respond to that shock? Well, there are two non-rational responses uh, that I'll go through first. One I think is implicit, is an implicit concern uh, is that'll be the way people behave is that people just continue spending uh, what they were spending before, which they could do in this example, but then there's a huge drop in spending at retirement. But there's another uh, uh, type of behavior that also would be um, irrational. And that is uh, they script and save uh, to make sure in retirement, they can get back up to that, you know, low $40,000 consumption. Uh, and it turns out what a rational response is, is to lower consumption now and have lower consumption in retirement. So uh, uh, shocks are bad, uh, that there's no question about it, negative shocks are bad, but I don't know if they're necessarily primarily bad for retirement, right? They're, they're bad for all periods. So uh, that affects what do we think, how do we evaluate a retirement system and, and what does it mean to be resilient? Okay, um, so now uh, let's take a broad picture uh, of the period that people are, are looking at and, and, and kind of uh, get an idea of what the shocks are. Okay, so what this what this chart shows uh, is the civilian age, uh, uh, population age 16 and over in every year, uh, or I'm sorry, in every month, this is monthly data, and it divides them into three groups, employed, unemployed, and not in the labor force. And for this chart, I'm using not seasonally adjusted data. All right, so a few things to, to take away from it. One is you notice a, a, a little squiggle, um, in employment, so there's seasonality within the year in employment. Um, that seasonality uh, also contributes to seasonality of not being in the labor force. All right, so it's, it's not uh, it's not that the labor force is flat throughout the year and unemployment varies. Um, it actually affects the labor force. Um, so uh, why is this important? Well, again, uh, the, the the authors uh, uh, the first two papers are, are are looking at retirement. What they're really doing is looking at changes in labor supply. And calling it retirement, I, I don't have a big problem with that because uh, they, they explain exactly what it is. But that measure is going to be uh, sort of polluted. It's going to be two things. It's going to be retirement. It's also going to be normal labor market churning. Of the two, though, the monthly, I, I'm more, much more concerned about the monthly measure than I am about the three-quarter measure, uh, particularly because of seasonality. All right. Uh, another thing is if you look at the recessions, what you see is that uh, typically, the, most of the response in the recession is coming from uh, increases in unemployment rather than uh, a decrease in the labor supply uh, or labor force. Uh, what's different uh, and what you see is uh, in this is that COVID's different now. Uh, the COVID shock was different. Um, okay, it's maybe hard, a little hard to see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just focus in on the period um, that Courtney is looking at. Uh, um, 2017 on, and I'm going to change the scale a bit so you can actually see a little bit more what's going on. So uh, what what you see is in with COVID, you had both a you know first of all really massive decline, sharp decline in employment, and but uh, 
it wasn't all an increase in unemployment. You also have people dropping out of the labor force. Um, uh, and so um, it, it's a little different, and it'll be particularly different um, with the two measures of, of, of timing of, uh, of, of retirement. Now, uh, the, the two papers don't um, go into whether retirement early is good or bad. Um, but uh, again, as we mentioned, Social Security claiming is not going up. So to me, what this highlights is the importance of what, with the safety net programs, what we used to refer to as automatic stabilizers. Um, so uh, one response to recessions is going to be the government kicking in and, 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 and helping people out. Now, in this recession, it was thought the safety net was not judged to be enough. Uh, and, and so we, we threw some money in. But, but that was where the, the response was. So it wasn't really the retirement system coming in to save the day. It was other programs uh, to, to counteract the shock. This is, all right, uh, there are two risks that uh, Rich uh, explicitly mentioned, but are implicit in a lot of discussions. One is the future Social Security. Um, this is the uh, CBO uh, projection of revenues and outlays. The trust funds everyone knows are going bust. Uh, what this chart shows to me is um, everyone would be better, all generations, future and current, uh, would be better off if we could keep taxes where they are and keep benefits where they are. But if we're going to bring them together, uh, we're either going to have to cut benefits or raise taxes. And I suggest, regardless of which one is done, what it's going to mean is future generations are going to be relatively worse off uh, than earlier generations compared to doing uh, to not changing current revenues. And, and whether we, uh, they're either going to be have less retirement income, but if uh, or they're going to have less income uh, to save from. The the point is they're going to be poor, and and it, it, you can't get around it uh, by doing it in one corner or the other. Uh, the other thing I'm going to uh, just quickly say is. When you go to the tax data, you see a lot of pension income right now, and a lot of that income is coming from defined benefit plans. So there's a lot of concern about defined benefit plans going away. I will say that uh, the bulk of that income, uh, the bulk of DV pension benefits that are paid out are coming from government employee DVs, not private sector DVs. So when you think of the job that DCs are gonna have to do to replace, uh, you should keep that in mind. And this is not a new phenomenon, uh, the, the, the recent demise of, of private sector DVs, this has actually always been the case.